Hello everyone, welcome to this talk. My name is Ina Hermans and I'm presenting today together with Julia Sartre. And we're going to talk about cognitive dimensions of notation. And this is maybe, maybe something you've never heard of in the context of program, program language design, but don't worry, we will take you through, through everything. About, about a year and a half ago, I joined TC39, which is the committee that designs JavaScript. It's very inter interesting to me as a newcomer that they used all these weird words that I didn't really know, like syntax budget, budget foot gun, gun, hurt its, its own weight. So it's like, like, what do those things mean? And it wasn't like, like random, right? People were using, using this semantically and they all seemed to understand each other very really well. And I didn't really understand them very well when we're, when we're talking about, about designing languages. It's just like, hmm, it seems like you're trying to describe proper properties of JavaScript, right? A good gun, you may have guessed what this means, is a feature that is easy, easy to chew up, easy, easy to shoot off in the food. food. With. But but then I was like, well, well, this these languages, these words, these concepts that you use, you all understand them, but they're already, already defined out there. And it's really hard, hard for newcomers to really understand what is going on. Like, like why would you say, hey, good. you could also, also say this is our wrong, right? There are already words in regular English to describe these things. And it's not, not just regular, regular English and used to describe something like error proneness. There, there are actually frameworks. And one of, one of the frameworks is what we're, we're going to describe today, cognitive dimensions of note notation, that also have tried to capture what these concepts mean. What do you mean when you say error prone? prone? And benefit, of course, of using an exist, existing framework is that then it is a bit more defined what actually something means. Whereas as now, in the situation we have currently, there's not really a consensus on, on how to talk about these things. There used to be sort of an idea of what words mean, what concepts mean, but it's not clear how they, how they relate to each other. And different, different people might have different opinions, different feelings with these certain concepts. So I was, I was a surprise as a newcomer coming into TCC9 that they would use their own sort of reinvented lingo so rather than using the framework like the, the framework cognitive dimension. So that is what we're going to look at today. The out outline of this more or less is that I first do a theoretical overview of what cognitive dimensions of notation are. And in the second half of this talk, Julia will actually dive into what those, those dimensions mean for JavaScript. And then we'll close the talk with Sort of, sort of the status of what have done so far with JavaScript and how has this, this framework helped us so far to get a better grasp of how to design the programming languages. So what are the cognitive dimensions of, of notation? The CDN frame, framework, as it's commonly called, called, is I call this, this lens to look, look at notations. Notations here is very broad. So the framework initially was designed to, to any sorts of, sorts of notation, diagrams, uh, musical notation, UIs, but sort of over time, CDN became more and more applied towards program languages. So the, the name now is a bit weird. What are some dimensions that, that are in the frame? Well, for example, there is error problems, right? How easy is it to make, make a statement something? Which is something we can do often with program programming language. People say, oh, Python is more error prone than Java. This is something people say. But there are other, other, other dimensions. dimensions. Well, for example, viscosity. How easy is it to change something? And there you might say that, that in Python it's easier to change something than in Java because in Python you don't worry about the type, the type system. You don't have to change the definition and all the call of a function. You can simply change only the definition and the calls will be fine. Another example dimension is the, the dimension of hard mental operations. How hard do you need to think about things? And the, and the programming language that we, we typically has hard mental operations it is, a, is a language Haskell. In Haskell, you have to do a lot of thinking. You have to make sure that all the, all the types fit each other well. This, this might pay off, right? It might be worth it to actually do hard mental operations, but you have to reason about ty types all time. You cannot program Haskell and, and not reason about types. And can program Python and not reason about types. So this is just to, to give a sense 
of the different types of dimensions that are in the framework. We will dive a bit deeper, deeper initially, and then Julia will dive lots deeper, deeper, specifically looking at edges of Java. As I said, said, Python and Java, Java and Haskell are ex examples of languages somewhere in the space of dimensions. And you can could, you could sort of gather, gather it together as languages out the type, type system. They typically have, have a higher error proneness. They typically have better viscosity. It's easy to change things. And they typically have, have less art mental operation. So you, you see that by looking at a few dimensions, to sort of classify languages, say, say the languages have high error proneness, and the languages have less uh, high, high uh, error, error proneness. So it helps you divide languages into certain groups to get a sense of the, the, the characteristics of languages. And what you see here is that these are characteristics we don't talk, talk about that much. You usually all design and design, and I guess in, in most of the talk talks that will be presented at the workshop day as well, we talk about the feature that you can measure, like performance. This language is so much, so much more quick than the other language. These dimensions are a bit so softer that it requires reasoning and arg argumentation and thinking. And it's very often in, in contrast to each other. So you'll say Java has better error proneness than Python, but you'll not say Java has error proneness of 0 0.6. Right? It, 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 we don't aim to, to measure, we aim to understand. So framework that very much fits with qualitative research and not so much with quantitative research. We aren't aiming to measure these, these dimensions. We're aiming to use these dimensions to better understand how pro programming can relate to each other, and specifically also how language can be improved on those dimensions. What is important to know is that these, that these dimensions influence each other. So adding one dimension, making add, adding some to your language, for it, for example, changing one, one dimension might, might influence another dimension. Imagine, this, this is something happening a little bit in Python, that a type system would be introduced, right? and they're going that direction a little bit with the type hints. So you could say we're adding a, a type to Python. This is going to improve their proneness. It will be harder to make mistakes because we can get compiler warning, interpreter or IDE warnings. But, but that is a neutral change, right? What we're taking away there might be a, a bit of viscosity. Now we have it's harder to change stuff, so we have less viscosity because now you have we have it about types. And you might also introduce a mental operation. So this is why the framework is called dimensions, because these things will influence and, and connect to each other. So as I said already a little bit, with the dimensions can be used to evaluate use a bit, use a bit of existing feature features and guide the design of new features. So if you want to add something to JavaScript, have a bunch of examples later in the talk, then you can think, hmm, we're adding this feature. What dimensions will be influenced? What dimensions will be neutral? What dimensions will be positively or negatively influenced? So it is in that, in that sense that's also a design tool. There's one more part of the framework that we haven't talked about, and that is activity. So the framework doesn't just describe the dimensions. It also describes different activities. And activities are things you do in a code, code base. The activities, for example, that the framework describes is exploration. So in, in exploration, you, you are like sketching with code, right? You want to implement something, but you don't really know how you're going to impl implement it. So you are thinking while programming. You can ima imagine that in the, ac ac the uh, activity of exploration, visco viscosity is very, very important. It's very important that you do things, that you aren't uh, hindered by the compiler. The comp compiler isn't me. You're like, no, 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 compiler, quite, quite dumb. I know what I'm doing. I just want to... When I explore a bit, but comprehension, where you are trying to understand the code base that someone else has written, or maybe you wrote it a long time ago, other dimensions play a role because in comprehension, maybe, maybe you do want, you want to have Wyler, right? Right? That is many warning warning because while comprehending, you make a little little change. You want the compiler to say no, that can be me changed because you, you're some aspect of it. So different activities put different demands on the dimensions. And a tight system, again, then is something that very much influences expo expo uh, exploration and, and comprehension because it's annoying if you're saying, but it's helpful if you're understanding. 
Yeah, so just to stress that the dimensions are requirements, right? Or desirable properties. In some context, in some domains, in some, in some code bases, you want to have hard, hard metal options, where in other situations, you want to have viscosity, or you, you are okay with error proneness if it comes with the, the trade off of something else. The reason why you want to use dimensions going forward in the programming language design or evaluation that you are doing is because it's so nice that it writes a shared language. So the reason that TC39 is excited about doing this is because it helps us understand and communicate with each other, but also with other people, people outside of our community. And it can very well add a checklist for new features. Have we thought about all the dimensions? Have we thought of how does this, this impact physical city? Because what we've seen sometimes in TC39 so far is that there's a lot of discussion, but then you just, just hear the first that people, people think about something like error proneness is very likely come up. People will say, oh, oh the feature is going to be confusing, which they mean it, it, it's going to make the, it, create situations in which people make mistakes. Other things are, are less about. So this, this list of dimensions can really be a checklist and helps to align in discussions and to invite you in also. The, the nice also about cognitive dimensions, we'll talk about that briefly later on, is that there is prior art on this. this for example, there exists questionnaires that you can, can use to assess, assess cognitive dimensions, which is if you use your, use your own lingo, a bit harder to, to make. And we can learn from all other languages that have already used the framework. Because the use the journey certainly isn't the first first language to be to be elevated with this with this work. It has been applied quite extensively in, in the context of visual lang languages, for example, block-based lang language like Scratch, Scratch or Lab have already been evaluated with cognitive dimension extensively, so we can learn from that. So we just we just covered a list of three example dimensions. There are many more dimensions. For example, the dimension of hidden dependencies, meaning how easy is it to see all the components of the framework and how they relate to each other. For example, seeing all classes in a code base and what classes call, call each other. Secondary notation, which is how easy is it to add, add some to notation that isn't ran by, by the compiler. The typical ex example here are comments. So comments are not part of the language per se. Uh, there's an extra thing you can, you can do to communicate with each other. Provisibility means how easy is it to sketch with with and which. Visibility means how, e how easy it is to see different parts of the code base. Again, something like all classes, uh, uh, all call sites, where this method being called, uh, all places where a certain variable is being changed. Role, role expecting this means how easy is to see what something is, is a variable, is an object, an int of a certain class. And consistency means how similar is the language. Do similar things work in similar ways across the code, code base? So that is just to give you an overview of the core dimensions. This might have been a, been a bit abstract so far, especially these new dimensions. Maybe you're like, hmm, what does that mean exactly? Exact. Well, Julia, now talk about these dimensions specifically with examples in JavaScript. So we're going to do a little, little switch between the, the two of us, and she, she will take over me. All right, uh, and now it's my turn. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'll be talking to you precisely about what Feline said, uh, which is how do these dimensions work in practice? And what we did, uh, like, I think it was one or two years ago, we went through a number of features that had been recently introduced to JavaScript and sort of thought about them from the perspective of the CDN framework. Um, and uh, currently what we're doing is we're applying that framework to new features. These historical examples, however, are a really great um, way to start to understand how it applies to a language. So we're going to use those. I'm going to start with viscosity. Now, viscosity re refers to, as Feline mentioned, a resistance to change in the language. Sometimes things are harder to change because they are harder to process. They're harder to change because they involve a lot of typing. Um, there are concrete examples like Fowler's shotgun surgery. Uh, but let's take a look at what viscosity might mean for something like JavaScript. Here's an example. We have a function foo. It takes three arguments, 
A, B, and C. It doesn't matter what it does. It also has a few call sites. Uh, call site A, B, and C. Could have done a slightly different naming there. But uh, given this, uh, let's say we want to change function foo to take another parameter. Um, if it takes one more, what we have to do is we have to go through each call site and add that parameter. This isn't too bad. This, this is something that we sort of expect in programming languages, and arguably IDEs can help us do this well. However, there is a new feature in JavaScript, which is um, the async await keywords. What these allow you to do is to sort of write asynchronous code in a way that looks a lot like synchronous code. It's a really popular feature because it um, simplifies the promise syntax, which looks uh, like a long chain of methods, of methods being called in an object, and it makes it look easier on the eyes. This is, has been an important feature for JavaScript programmers, the ergonomics and the feel of the language. So we introduced this new piece of syntax, async await. However, the impact of async await comes with a cost. Specifically, all of the call sites now have to be nested in async functions because the await keyword is a syntax error if it's not within an async context. This can result in significant refactorings, especially if you have what becomes an asynchronous call um, at the top level of a piece of code. Now in JavaScript, because we exist within the browser environment, we can't block the main thread. It's something that is a main tenant of how we design new APIs for JavaScript. However, we can do some work up front if we're still loading files. And this is what resulted in a, a new feature. Now let's take a look at how uh, these impacts of viscosity um, relate to async await. Uh, so viscosity had a net negative impact when we introduced async await while editing. We have this new feature, top level await, which undoes the viscosity by allowing you to use the await keyword at the top level of modules. This was a way to address something that might be called a mistake or something that might be called an oversight when we initially designed async await syntax. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Another uh, thing to keep in mind is that uh, dimensions can be in tension. Uh, this is exactly what was shown by async await syntax. We wanted to make it easier for people to read the code, but as a result of doing that, we had actually made the code more error prone and also more viscous. Let's take a look at this example in more depth. In this case, we're going to take error proneness and provisionality as the two dimensions we investigate. Error proneness uh, describes to what extent does the notation influence the likelihood of the user making a mistake. Uh, Counterintuitively, error proneness means how likely the code is to throw errors, whereas something like provisionality is how tolerant is the code to the user making errors um, without stopping the user from being able to make those errors. Uh, JavaScript is quite famously, and also the web platform as a whole, is quite famous for being a very tolerant platform, uh, allowing users to miss pieces of syntax and still have things render more or less the way that they expect. So um, here's one famous example from JavaScript uh, of error proneness being missing. This is a case of provisionality instead being in place. We have um, two consts. Uh, these are non-changeable um, values being assigned to A and B. Uh, and then we're checking whether or not A and B are equivalent to one another. We say that A is 1, and then we say that B is 1. This will result in evaluating A equals B to true as we expect. If we make a change and say that B is true and use this exact same syntax, it will likewise be true. Now, in more strict languages, this would be an error, or this would evaluate to false. Uh, because we're uh, an error because if you're in a strongly typed language, this would be an, thrown as an error, or uh, it would, if the equality sign was strongly um, strongly associating to the values, to the types that are in play here, it would return false. Now, because this behavior was unintuitive for a number of programmers, we introduced the triple equal sign, which I think is pretty unique to JavaScript. I don't think many languages need this, uh, this addition. This allows us to say that A and B must also be of the same type. And in this case, we will return false. Now, I mentioned that 
this is both about error proneness and provisionality. Why would developers want to use the double equal sign? Provisionality as a dimension is described as the ability to allow users to make indicative, indicative selections before making definitive choices. It reduces premature commitment, which improves the usability of the system. Premature commitment means you do a whole lot of work to describe what you're trying to um, program, but then it turns out that your mental model was maybe a little bit off and you have to roll back all of those changes. That can be difficult, especially for new programmers who are not so familiar with what they're doing. Um, it can be a high cost to pay for making a mistake. So let's take a look at how provisionality impacts this example. Again, we have the same setup. A equals one, B equals true. This isn't exactly uh, uh, the same type, but it evaluates to true. In fact, in JavaScript, we say that A is truthy and B is also truthy. However, this is really great if you just want to check if something exists. And we have a number of values in JavaScript, a number of types in JavaScript, which will evaluate to a truthy value that allows you to use them in the if statement as shown on the screen. This can be really handy to use, and you'll see this pattern a lot in JavaScript. Now, this is exactly what we were talking about earlier. What happens when uh, you use the double equal sign, when you have something like the double equal sign in a language that works in this way? Error proneness is negatively impact, while provisionality is positively impacted. And in particular, this is during the activity of experimenting, while the programmer is discovering how they want to solve a given problem in their domain. Let's talk about another one uh, related to a more recent feature in JavaScript. This is something called visibility, and we're going to look at how this dimension is impacted in relation to specific users and specific tasks they may be doing. What do we mean by that? Visibility is how readily the required parts of the notation can be identified, accessed, and made visible. The example we're going to use is going to be function syntax in JavaScript and how we modified that function syntax in response to the requests by developers, in particular professional developers. Here we have a function that takes an argument x uh, being assigned to a variable a. This function returns a, uh, a function uh, which takes a variable y and when that is called it returns an addition of x and y. In order to call it, uh, you invoke it using a, the first parameter with parentheses, and then the second parameter. Now, programmers were frustrated by how difficult it was to read the important parts of the function. So they requested that we redesign the function syntax to make it terser and more condensed. What, we resulted, what resulted out of this process was what you see on the screen now. Uh, you can do something like an a arrow y arrow and then x plus y. For people who are familiar with the syntax, all of the important information is right up front. You can see everything that's going to happen here and how to call it. However, different users will be impacted differently by different kinds of notation. In which case is it better to have the notation that you see on the right? And in which cases is it better to have the notation you see on the left? Well, let's take a look. Now here we have two classes of users, beginners and experts. When we look at the first example that we took a look at, which is the longer function syntax where you have to write out the whole word and have the return value, what we find is that the function syntax works better for beginners in terms of visibility, but it works worse in terms of visibility for experts. Let's break down why that is. Now, um, here, what we see is that the y variable is being bound deeply nested in the function syntax. For uh, experts, it takes a lot of reading to get to the important information. But if you take a look at how beginners might read this, they can read this almost like a sentence. They can say function takes argument x and it returns a function that takes argument y, which returns x plus y. This reads like a sentence. Let's take a look at this more, um, at this terser example that we saw in the second round, which is called arrow syntax. Now, arrow syntax is worse for beginners in terms of visibility, and it's better for experts. Let's consider why that might be. 
Now, for the experts, if they're looking for a specific variable, they can see it right away. They know exactly what they're looking for because they're familiar with the syntax. But for a beginner, they won't know, sorry, they won't know what to look for. What does the arrow mean? How do you pronounce that arrow? How do you understand what this syntax returns? How does it evaluate? It's not immediately clear what this is for a beginner. Now, let's consider another impact, which is diffuseness. Now, diffuseness and terseness are two sides of the same coin. Uh, diffuseness is when something is longer, and what we were looking at earlier with a long function syntax, we were looking at how diffuseness helps beginners with uh, readability. But in this case, we're now looking at diffuseness in relation to writing. So once beginners are trained in the syntax and they start writing it themselves, it's a positive impact because they can write out what their intention is more quickly. And the same applies to experts. So this is also related to how a dimension not only is deter how a dimension is impacted is not only determined by who is uh, writing the code, but also by what they're doing, in this case writing. Now I'm going to hand it over back to Feline and we're going to talk about CDN in practice uh, also in TC39. All right. Thank you, Julia, for that overview. I hope it made the dimensions a bit more concrete, that you get a better sense of what we mean if we talk about a certain dimension. We already have got some benefits. And as I said, one of, the, one of the benefits is that there is a questionnaire for this that you can use. And I have a reference to the paper here. We can certainly put it on the, no on the notes bar as well. well. You can use this if you are curious about a certain language or framework or tool that you are using. How does this tool do on the dimensions where we ask users, for example, is it easy? Is it easy to make changes? Is it long or short? And you can see from these questions, you don't have to necessarily use the word, the lingo of CDN to still, still be able to understand from users how a certain tool or framework or language is, is doing these features. Don't worry that if, if you would do this with users, users in interview setting, you would have to, to explain all of this in detail. That isn't necessary for this questionnaire. What is all very nice, nice here is different design, designs compared. So you, so you see image here from a paper where that I wrote that I with a grad student, where we can compare two different notions to do, do the same thing. We created a tool called Excel Block, which is a visual user interface, interface Excel spreadsheet formulas, and compared that to the formulas people are used to. And you see in this graph, this graph on the different dimensions that Excel scores lower on many of the dimensions than our new framework. So, so in our new framework, um, it is easier to see the different components, which is why visibility is high, higher compared compare, compare to L. So, so it's, it used this as well, well to compare the different languages. And as I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be two entirely different notations. It can also be your framework v1 versus your, your framework v2 to see if a certain feature, feature adds something, which, which is also an example that, that you just gave before, that adding a certain feature might change the language in a way that some of the dimensions impacted. Wrapping this back to TC39 to give you a sense of what has this framework done for us so far, far many of the th things that inform formally or used in TC39 actually, actually have equivalence in CN. People sometimes say, is this worth its own noise? Like, is it is it worth adding this? Is, does it have high usability, this abstraction? Food gun we talked about. about. Syntax budget, budget means thing like, we, we, we are going to do, we are adding abstraction, but, but is it worth the error power process? And if we, if we talk about learnability in JavaScript, which is something that's often talked about, maybe what we actually need is consistency. If you already know this part of part of the language, it's easy to travel your understanding to a different part of the language. And what's nice also is that applying the work on TC39 lets us just to discover some things in TC39 that we don't, don't often call. For example, viscosity. This this isn't thing where people said, oh, but this was, will make code harder to change. Just did you have that word not 
we, we, we never synonym either. We just didn't talk about it so much. And the same is true for role expressiveness. Sometimes called with a little bit, little bit of the umbrella of some sugar that's a, that's a bit broad, of course. Where it's like, is it clear what the thing is? Is the syntax express, express clear enough what is, what is going here? So you see, you see that applying such a framework on the discussion also leads to holes. And in a similar way, I'm sure that applying your, the framework to your own tools will also show you all your tools dimensions where hmm, I have never thought, thought about the physical or the hard mental operations, et cetera, of, of my tool. So the benefit very much is a shared language that's known inside and outside of the community. And it makes us aware, aware of the decisions that were made, but weren't were made in a very explicit way be before. And it allows us to use tools that already were developed, like the questionnaire or the graph that, that I showed you based on the questionnaire. Just to give you a sense to close up of what, what we've done so far. So we have actually implemented some of this already in, in TC29. So, so we're, we're to more and more, not just with CDN, but also in, in a broader sense, to, to make language design of TC, TC39 be evidence-based. So we did a survey on the pipeline operator, we have been inter interviews on expressions, and we're planning also the number of change feature to do some experimentation using uh, so sometimes also using the CDN framework, but in a broader sense, also using evidence to show the design of language. And within TC39, we even have a research, research page, so it's something I'm, I'm happy about, where, where we will committee discuss papers and discuss research lens. So it's very much applying what we know, we know programming language design, the, the, the user act of it, and applies on a ma mainstream language, JavaScript. So I think that's everything we wanted, everything we, we have the time for. So I guess, I guess not in the setting of the workshop, there'll be a little bit of time for discussion. And of course, if you want to know more about this, if you want to talk with me and Julia about this, please feel free to reach out. We'll, we'll make sure that contact information is on the workshop. So, so, but so definitely, if you're considering doing something like that in, in your own language, definitely re reach out to us. We would really love to hear from you and share our, our experiences so far. Yep. Thanks a lot for having us here.